Hello lighting people, welcome back to my Lua for Grand Me 3 tutorial series. Time to make a trip to the hardware store because we're going to be building tables today. Wait, <laughs> whoops, wrong kind of table. <laughs> These ones are not made with a hammer and nails and you can't eat, do crafts, or set your lighting console on them either. Instead, we're going to be talking about a Lua tool called a table that is one of the most powerful tools in Lua and it can be used to sort, organize, label, and retrieve data really easily. If you've used other programming languages, you may think of them similarly to arrays, but the concept is more similar to the arrays of Java and Scheme than C or Pascal, apparently. To be honest, I don't know any of those languages, but that's what the book Programming in Lua says, so I'll take their word for it. Now, for our use of tables in Lua, there's not actually a lot that you can do in Lua without tables, so I used them for a long time without actually understanding how they worked, and that resulted in me often programming things in the hardest way possible. Obviously, that's not very ideal, so I'm going to help you skip that part of the journey and start off strong with a clear understanding of tables before we start using them. Let's get to it. So, what exactly is a table? First off, it's neither a variable nor is it a value. Programming in Lua defines it as an object, so you can think of it as an object just like your physical table. Or the way I like to think of it is as a container that holds data. That's technically what a variable is, but the difference is that a table can hold compartmentalized data, labeled, separated, and neatly stored. A table contains keys and values in pairs. So for every key, there is a value. A key is like the identifier for the value or the name that refers to the value. A table is actually anonymous by default. Unlike a variable, which can only exist if it has a name, a table can be used, for example, in an argument, without actually defining a name for it. Most of the time though, you are going to use a variable to reference the table. So I'm gonna go into Visual Studio Code and make a table to show you how it works. I'm going to make a table, I'm gonna call it my table, and my table is going to be looking like this. That is a table, that's it. Of course, this is an empty table. You can put values into the braces straight away or you can create it with empty braces and insert values later or you can add values when you create it and still add more later. There are lots of options. Like I said, you arrange the table in keys and values. So every value has to have a key. A key can be either a string or a number. And if you use a variable, it will interpret it as the string or number it references. There are several ways you can add data to a table. One is when you create it. So I'll add a key value pair to the table I just created right where I created it. So I have my table is equal to, I'm gonna put a equals one. Now my table contains a value called A, that is the key is A, and the value is one. This A looks like a variable, but believe it or not, it's actually read as a string and there's no way to use a variable or a number as a key when you add values to a table this way. Now I've made this table, let's say a little later down the road, I want to add another piece of data to my table with the key B. I can do it like this. I'm gonna use square brackets and put in quotes B equals two. When you add data this way, however, the string B that is being used as a key has to be written in quotes. Otherwise, it's read as a variable and currently the variable B doesn't exist. So it would just be nil. You can't set a table key to nil. Now, if I were to try to add data using braces like I did before, it would overwrite rather than add to my table. But just like when I used the braces to originally make the table, this method right here sets the value in table my table at key B equal to two. This method works no matter whether the key is a string, a number or variable referencing one or the other. There is another method that again only works if the key is a string and that looks like this. My table dot C is equal to three. So in this case, C is the same as if I put a C right here, it's the same thing, it's a string. It's not the same as my table C in brackets. That would be using C as a variable again. Now one thing about table keys or indices is that, that is important to understand is that you don't have to define them like I have so far. If you want to know for sure what the key is, it's useful to do so. It's called giving the key a name or creating named table values. 
but you can also simply insert a value or several at a time separated by commas and it will automatically number them starting with one and going up. For example, I'll create another table. This one's called my new table and it's going to be equal to one, two, three. So in this case, I have index one has the value one, index two has the value two, index three has the value three. Maybe a better uh, example would be 10, 20, 25, just to be different. Index one has the value 10, index two has the value 20, and index three has the value 25. There's also another way that you can add to tables that only works with numeric indices. So here's how that one works. Table.insert. And you're going to put an X, a Y, and a Z value in here, where X is the name of the table that you're inserting into, Y is the index where you want the value to be inserted, and Z is the value you wish to insert. Y is actually optional, so if you leave it blank, Z will be inserted into the next unused index in the table. And you cannot specify Y as an index that doesn't yet exist unless it is one. Also, if you insert a value at index Y, it will remove the old Y and those following up by one index each. So in other words, to actually use this in a way that makes sense, I'm gonna go table.insert my new table value two, or sorry, index two, and I'm gonna put the value as a value, just a string here. Um, obviously that value can be anything, it can be a number or it can be a string. Um, by the way, even with this one, like these can be strings, they can be variables, they can be whatever you want them to be. They can even be other tables. So basically in this case, this inserts a value at index two. So then whenever you try to read this table, 10 is going to be at index one. The string a value is going to be at index two. 20 is going to be at index three and 25 is going to be at index four. Okay, this is all great for creating tables, but how do we retrieve the information we've so carefully stored away in the table? The good news is it's exactly the same syntax used to store it. So just use table.index or table in brackets index like this, anywhere you wish to use that value. Do not try to print the table as a whole because a table is an object, not a value. And while values can be printed, objects can't since obviously we don't have 3D printers in our command line or anything. I understand there are so many different syntaxes and the rules for setting and calling table values and remembering strings versus variables versus numbers and which ones can be written in which way can be very confusing. So I've actually made a table info example file you can find on GitHub and I'll link that as well to refer to at any time. Hopefully that will help. By the way, these double dashes here let you put comments in the code. So this, anything beyond the double dashes is commented out and the program does not read it when it's going through the code. It's just for you to read to see information and you can use these at any time in any Lua program. I use comments pretty heavily and really most people do because it's not necessarily easy to remember what everything means when you write a big program and having comments to remind yourself, oh, I did this for this reason, or this is what this function does is super helpful. Okay, I'm going to show you one brief example of storing and retrieving table values just so you can see how it works. I'm going to create a table called my sequence and I'm going to give it a value called name and make that a string test and then I'm going to give it an I, a value called ID and set that equal to one. And now I'm going to create a command, cmd indirect weight, like I showed you in the last video. And this one's going to say store sequence my sequence dot ID. I'll tell you in a minute what these dots mean. Uh, slash no confirm uh, semicolon label sequence 
mysequence.id my sequence dot name all right now these dots like I said um, they actually mean to concatenate two things and what that means is it just um, like connects them together so if you concatenate two strings it turns them into one string and that's basically what's happening here so we're going to if you read this command the way it's actually going to appear in the program it's going to say store sequence my sequence dot id so it takes the value in the table my sequence at the index id that would be one so store sequence one slash no confirm semicolon a label sequence um again my sequence id so that's one uh and then we put another single quote space double quote so that ma3 can read it properly um and then concatenate the name my sequence dot name which would be test and then another double quote here so that ma3 can read it as a string as well obviously that doesn't matter in this case because it's only one word if it was multiple words or it had a space ma3 would need those quotes to be able to read it properly but that's going to interpret it that way and so that's the way this works. Um, the only thing I will say about concatenation is anytime you're trying to concatenate a nil variable that, that is, well, anything that's equal to nil, you're going to get an error and your whole plugin will just stop working. So make sure you're never trying to concatenate a variable that you don't know has a value. Now I'm going to take this and put it in MA3 and run it so that you can see all of that. And as you can see, store sequence one, and we labeled sequence one test. So that worked properly. We had no issues with that. Now in the next video, I'm going to show you how you can take these values that are currently baked into your plugin, you know, the ID and the name, and let the user define them instead. Yes, you can actually ask the user for the name and ID, and then quickly store a sequence based on their answers. And there are lots of other things you can do too, like there are all kinds of actions you can do based on uh, user input, and it's really exciting. You're going to absolutely love it. So the next video is going to get into some of that, and it's going to involve one of the most common uses I have for tables. That is a really awesome MA3 function called message box. This is like confirm, but on steroids. It's super powerful and very customizable. I use it all the time because you can do so many things with it from custom text boxes and inputs to all different types of buttons, but you can also use it more simply without as much customization, making it quick and easy to add to any plugin. It will be called using a table as an argument and also returns values in the form of a table. Everything you learn today is going to make them make so much more sense. And since I don't think I have a single plugin I use regularly that doesn't include at least one message box. I can promise that understanding it well is going to help you more than you could possibly dream. So I'll see you in the next video. Until then, happy lighting.